My Life as an Animal, Serialization, Week 3. This episode is brought to you by animalaid.org.uk, who campaign peacefully against all forms of animal abuse and promote cruelty-free living. It's now time to continue our audiobook here on UK Health Radio, My Life as an Animal, written by Andrew Tyler and read by Jim Smith. My Life as an Animal On being a music journalist, the noise around the product. Thomas and I had stupidly let the air between us sour and that meant it was painful bidding him farewell. I was comparatively worldly wise when we first met, on Canada's west coast in 1969. He was a small-town boy who'd never strayed more than a few miles from home. Anthropologically speaking, I was a man with a big moustache and a big guitar from a faraway country. I had come with stories of barefoot San Francisco hippies and West End London clubs, like the Whiskey A Go Go in Wardour Street, where, in the mid 60s, charged up with purple heart pills, we dance an ecstatic jerky dance to tracks like The Four Seasons Rag Doll and The Crystals, and then he kissed me. Thomas possibly saw me as Mr. Experience and decided I could show him a handful of city slicker tricks. I, on the other hand, was mesmerized by the grindingly methodical way in which he rounded on projects, big and small. There were the impressive one-inch-high log cabins that Thomas would create from 20 or 30 wooden matchsticks, split lengthways several times with a sharp razor. The cabin had a sloping tiled roof, a chimney, a couple of windows with ledges, and even a pile of logs in a porch that was cut from the matchbox itself. How must London have seemed to Thomas and to Mickey? They said they enjoyed its quirky vibrancy, strange clothes on weird people, and they were wide-eyed over the capital's monumental architecture, corny old Big Ben and Whitehall's imposing government buildings that hark back to an age of strutting empire. For Mickey, the contrast with where he came from made him long to be back there. After just a couple of months in London, melancholia was overtaking him. He missed and worried about his mother, and he missed the taste of dust and gasoline when starting up his truck for a ride into town. But it would be another three months before Thomas was ready to return to BC and take Mickey with him. Even before arriving in London, Thomas was writing songs. They were plain, functional tunes, accompanied by buck-yourself-up lyrics for the love lawn. Thomas was expecting at least half a dozen of them to be included in our set, which would mean jettisoning several of mine. Our disputes over the relative merits of his songs versus my songs saw us at our infantile and boastful worst. We would be as sulky and idiotic as each other, but being older and supposedly a man of the world, I should have seen Thomas coming up on the rails as a songwriter and encouraged him rather than allowing my vanity to block his path. A more prosaic reason for our having fallen out is that we were done living elbow to rib in a shared room that was too small for one person, let alone three. There was still a hint of lingering sourness the afternoon in August 1971 when I travelled with the boys to Piccadilly Underground from where they would make their way to Heathrow. I hugged Mick goodbye. Thomas would offer me only a chaste hand to shake. You got your passports? I called after them. I turned to the small ads and took a three-night fill-in stint on the pumps at a South Tottenham petrol station. Then Mitch found an ad for a writer on Disc and Music Echo. The editors said during my interview that they were looking for someone younger to fit their post-teeny-bop readership profile. At 25, I was three years too ancient. But a couple of days later, I got a phone call offering me the job. Their target audience, I was now told, was older teens to early 20s. 
And while my running about in recent years didn't suggest workplace stability, it did signify a taste for adventure, a taste for the new. These were ideal traits, I was told, for a writer on a rock music magazine. I had landed the perfect job. Under Gavin Petrie's editorship, Disc and Music Echo continued its transformation from a weekly magazine that genuflected before the music industry while serving up uncritical pap to an easily manipulated young audience into a source of features and reviews that concern themselves with real musicians, the music they made and the lives they led. Among my first published pieces was a November 1971 interview with Nicky Hopkins, who I called the world's best-known anonymous pianist. For years, he had backed the biggest names in rock and was now emerging from the small print of record sleeves with his own album that George Harrison and a couple of Rolling Stones were helping out on. It was a project that seemed unlikely just a few months before when Hopkins was flat out in a San Francisco hospital with jaundice, a blood clot and severe renal disease that led to one of his kidneys being removed. His wife was told to prepare for his death. My assignment had everything. Here was a musician of quality who, perhaps prompted by his brush with death, was now hungry for the fame that had come to many of those whose cause he had served. He had played on the monster tracks of the era, but as a hired hand was rarely paid residuals. It's worth listing some of the tracks on which he featured. The Kinks, Sunny Afternoon. The Who, Any Way, Anyhow, Anywhere. The Rolling Stones, Sympathy for the Devil. Street Fighting Man. Give Me Shelter. Tumbling Dice. Angie. Time Waits for No One. Cat Stevens, Matthew and Son. The Beatles, Revolution. Jefferson Airplane, Wooden Ships. John Lennon, Jealous Guy. How Do You Sleep? Oh, Yoko. Happy Christmas, War Is Over. Carly Simon, No Secrets. George Harrison, Give Me Love, Give Me Peace on Earth. Rod Stewart, You're In My Heart. Over the next two or three years, I would meet and interview a galaxy of bill toppers, many of them more famous than talented. Most conversations would take place in the offices of a management company or publicist. Others would be at a band rehearsal or in a hotel room in the early hours following a gig. I interviewed Leonard Cohen in a dreary central London sandwich bar and came away with a quote that is still passed like a gemstone between Cohen adepts. Poetry is an accurate reportage of events that take place on an interior landscape. And if you attempt to translate them to an exterior landscape, it suffers what all those things suffer. Some of my subjects confounded expectations. Others confirmed them. David Bowie struck me as a bland suburban boy trying hard to be interesting. Stevie Wonder was uninhibited, funny and tall. Rod Stewart was sex and booze fixated and Bruce Springsteen was using an oafish manager to shield him from cutthroats in the media and music business. But Springsteen was not prepared to accept responsibility for his manager's excesses. Other encounters included those with Bill Haley, John Lennon, Paul Simon, Marianne Faithful, John McLaughlin, Carlos Santana, Yoko Ono, The Average White Band, Little Richard, Jerry Lee Lewis, Ringo Starr, Stephen Stills, Graham Nash, Ozzy Osbourne, 10 CC, The Carpenters, Procol Harum, Ray Davis, Jimmy Page, Brenda Lee, and Monty Python, with whom I spent several days on the set of the Holy Grail. My first pieces were published as the British music press was undergoing an identity switch. The ties that bound the weeklies to the big labels and recording companies were about to be severed, it seemed. No longer would we writers be worked like ventriloquist dummies by industry reps concerned only with units sold and chart positions. From now on, we will be as caustic and subversive as we liked when assessing the industry's latest expensively hyped signing. 
In reality, we were used just as people doing our job had always been used, to create a noise around industry product. The difference was we were blinded to this truth by our growing self-regard, which was visible in the stories we filed. Many of us had adopted the breathless linguistic mannerisms of new journalism, whereby the author, rather than the musician, takes centre stage. We were now aspirants, every bit as ambitious as our interviewees. It was this vanity that the labours exploited, and it was done the old-fashioned way, by flattery and by plying us with fine liquor, free record albums, and regular trips overseas where we'd be put up in expensive hotels and get taken from here to there in chauffeur-driven limos with darkened windows. Several times a week, it seemed, there was a reception, yet more southern comfort, smoked salmon and plump Greek olives to mark the launch of a new talent or a new album by an established act. A rather poignant, unshowy promo was for rock and roll pioneer Bill Haley and his April 1974 performance at South End's Chicken in a Basket venue, Talk of the South. A limo driver took me from my West London flat to my older brother Nick's house in South End, a short distance from the venue. My wide-eyed, grinning sibling settled himself beside me in the back seat, and within minutes we were at the nightclub, where I was refused entry because I wasn't wearing a tie. Being a big-shot London writer made no difference. The nearest available tie was at Nick's house, so it was back to the limo for a dress code rescue mission. The South End crowd were appreciative as Bill and his Comets worked through their dusty classics. It was Haley's Rock Around the Clock that began the age of rock and roll, ending the dominance of half-asleep pop and jazz crooners such as Sinatra, Perry Como and Dean Martin. But that night in South End, it was Bill himself who looked to me a defeated figure, waxen in the face, that once buoyant kiss curl at his brow, now an absurdity. I could have been wrong. Maybe I was seeing a fulfilled performer who was content to recapitulate, year after year, evidence of that brief golden moment between Sinatra and Elvis when he, Bill Haley, was king. But it didn't look that way. I later discovered that Haley spoke of his long battle with alcohol in a 1974 BBC interview. He continued performing until January 1980 when... Age 55 and with a recently diagnosed brain tumour, he died. On that April evening in 1974, when Bill came to South End, Nick and I together experienced for a few hours the corny trappings of success. The chauffeur, the limo, a meal and a show for free. Not bad, we might have thought, considering where we came from. Some of the first songs I ever wrote were with Nick. We were probably 16 and 15, and not long out of what was rebranded the Norwood Home for Jewish Children. Nick lived with our grandparents, Nan and Pop, at 82 Guinness Flats, and I lived yards away in an identical unit with my kid brother, Mitch, and my mother and her husband, Joe. Nick had been with Nan and Pop from when he was an infant, my mother having pleaded that she was unable to cope with all three boys when the decision was made to put us into Nord, Nan and Pop fought for Nick to remain with them. He was happy and they were managing, but my mother refused. She wanted us kept together. Why did any of us have to go? Mitch, who grew close to Joe, became like his true son, told me that Joe had said to my mother at the point they were about to get married that he couldn't cope with us boys being around. Joe was 18 at the time. My mother was ten years older. She was faced with a choice, her boys or her boyfriend. Her boyfriend won. When Joe finally came clean with Mitch about that episode, he was crying. He told Mitch it was the worst decision of his life. In truth, it was more than a decision. It was a policy given that we were left at the home for eight years until Nick was fifteen and Norwood wouldn't have him any longer. Mitch, though, had been returned to the Guinness Flats after just a few months. He was four years old when sent to that bleak southeast London institution and soon showed every sign of breaking apart. Ultimately, my mother and Joe had no choice. 
Mitch had got hold of some matches and started a fire in a dormitory. This happened after he'd been shamed yet again for having wet his bed in the night. His dirty sheet was pegged to a line where all the other boys in the house could see it. The fire was his escape plan. It spread. A lot of damage was done. The principal wanted rid of him. I was thankful I had Nick with me during those eight Norwood years. Even though being 15 months older than me, he stuck with kids his own age. He had always been an unusually tall boy, growing eventually to six foot three inches. His height led him to being drawn into fights he didn't want. I recall one at Norwood on my behalf as we were undressing in our dormitory. A larger boy was goading me without reason, pushing me against one of the white-painted iron beds. Nick told him to stop, and soon they were shoving, punching and wrestling each other. I'd had to watch Nick fight only twice, the other time while on a camping trip where there seemed to be hundreds of other boys from all over the south of England. That one had begun with pointless name-calling, and suddenly I was seeing Nick grab from behind, and falling on his shins to the muddy ground. My great oak of a brother covered in mud. How it hurt to see him that way, and how I wished, just like the fight in the dormitory, it had been me instead of him. The camping trip fight petered out. The dormitory one was brought to an end by a housemaster. Nick pulled off his socks and showed me half a dozen splinters that had lanced the soles of his feet. As he and his opponent pulled and pushed at each other on the uneven wooden floor. Our songwriting sessions in the Guinness Flats were fueled by bottles of fizzy cream soda and penny sweets. Our work tools were a reel to reel tape recorder and a perennially out of tune guitar on which I could play a dozen chords. We also did mock radio interviews in which we'd impersonate big name sports reporters and athletes. Two or three years later, we would be calling on Denmark Street music publishers with our taped compositions. Nick carried on writing and peddling the results after I left for Canada. Within just 10 or 12 weeks of my departure, he got news to me that our song, called My Wife's Fallen in Love with a Milkman, was to be recorded and released as a single by the then extremely successful Manfred Mann Group. The thrilling sensation that our lives were about to be transformed lasted just two days. The Manfreds found another masterpiece that they preferred. Ha ha, said the clown. The songwriting dream gradually faded for Nick. He embarked on a printing apprenticeship that went on for years, during which time he developed a deep appreciation for what is probably the most magnificently cumbersome machine the world has seen. The linotype was like a gigantic, crazy typewriter that was fed ingots of lead and, via its 90-character keyboard, could produce an entire line of metal type and then return the raw material to its inbuilt type store or magazine for reuse. With an operator at the keys, the linotype machine was a symphony of moving parts, gliding, grinding and clicking in blissful dissonance. Prior to the linotype, typesetting for printers was done manually, using a composing stick and drawers full of metal letters. Nick's apprenticeship also delved into printing's past. The invention of the modern printing press by 15th century blacksmith, goldsmith and publisher Johannes Gutenberg. His introduction of mechanical movable type printing to Europe changed everything helping to launch the Renaissance and ending with a spread of learning to the masses. What of the future? Nick's course imagined the linotype losing its clickety clatter and learning to work twice as fast. Instead, and virtually overnight, computerized offsetting replaced hot metal printing and the world in which the linotype was sovereign was gone. Undeterred, Nick went on to establish a sizable printing business using the new technologies and employing 30 or more people at various times. A dozen years ago, Australia beckoned, and he lives out there now with his wife Barbara, their two sons, their sons' wives and their four grandchildren. Bill Haley at the Talk of the South 1974 is now a long way from 21st century Nick 
sweltering poolside under the Queensland sun. Consciously or not, he has located himself at the sunny centre of a family clan that is full of the usual passions, intrigues, squabbles and love. The very thing that was missing from his fractured childhood. that makes you feel good. UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good. Being a music journalist, stars and scribes. That 1974 Haley piece was written not for disc, but for the New Musical Express, soon to be the quicker off the tongue NME. As thrilled as I was to be on disc's payroll, the NME was the pinnacle for 1970s rock music writers. It was the NME that, beginning in 1971 or 72, was the storehouse of conceit and absurd posturing, but also of writing talent, with its wittily self-conscious use of headlines, pictures and captions. It was beginning to influence the grown-up Fleet Street Nationals. The star writers in that first golden age were Charles Shaw Murray and Nick Ken. Charlie was the polished, wisecracking prose stylist who turned phrases in on themselves to reveal their inner nonsense. He loved and studied the blues and often kept a blues harp, probably in the key of D, in his pocket. He wore his hair big in a gigantic white boy's afro. As well as the blues, Charlie loved all kinds of contemporary stuff. Thin Lizzy, Roxy, Hendrix, Bowie, Iggy Pop. Nick Kemp was more exotic, but not so exotic that he couldn't appreciate mainstream greats such as the Beatles and the Beach Boys. His speciality, at least for a while, was the dissolute new wave types. Johnny Thunders, the Ramones, Richard Hell, Television, the New York Dolls, Amar and Pa, Lou Reed and Patti Smith. Charlie had a ferocious commitment to his craft. The copy he delivered for subbing was clean, on time, and shorn of excess, despite the rate of which it poured out of him. He knew that both the quips and the deeper stuff worked better like that. He was especially impressive when churning through the heap of often hopeless singles released by the record companies each week. His review of a remake of Brenda Lee's 1960 classic, I'm Sorry, read, So you should be. If Charlie, in terms of his writing, was from Groucho Marx country, where the quips are rust-proof and enduring, I arrived in a taxi and left in a huff. Nick was a Lord Byron man in lace and leather, tall, skinny, and with a swishing, heavy, lidded, stumbling gait. His sentences, when he was on form, stretched and twisted and were full of sly rhythm and purpose. When his inner tuning fork gave him a bum note, his prose was gaudily overdressed and dragged you on a long meander to nowhere. I must remember as I write these words how very young these titans of rock criticism were. Both born in 1951, Nick and Charlie were just 21 or 22 in their brilliant pomp. Charlie knew all the contemporary taboo words because his politics were contemporary. Nick was fashionably disengaged, and as late as April 1973, in an NME piece on David Bowie, was writing of a surly-looking Negro who was eyeing me suspiciously for a full ten minutes. Nick in his stack heel leather boots and lacy white top, what was there to stare at? It might be said that drugs defineth the man. Charlie liked his spliffs, and when the battery ran low, he went for speed. Lots of it. I believe Nick found dope rather commonplace, even though he did periodically smoke it. His special weakness was heroin. It gave him that look of a dreamy languor, 
of life seen through a veil beyond which everything was brutish and foul. On his side of the veil was Potmark's romance and refinement. Here were Byron, Verlaine, Rambo and their contemporary manifestation, Keith Richards. Heavy-lidded Keith did smack, and Nick adored the idea of being like Keith, with whom he did get to hang out. Keith, meanwhile, was always being compared with Byron, which I doubt troubled him. Marianne Faithful said of Keith Richards, with whom she shared a bed, he's the epitome of the romantic hero, and if you're a middle-class girl and you've read your Byron, that's Keith Richards, even now. He's turned into Count Dracula now, but he's still an injured, tortured, damn youth, which is really such fun, isn't it? I mean, he really is such fun. It was fun while it was fun, but even though we older NMEers were only just past our mid-20s, we were already beginning to feel the effects of our dashed expectations of the 60s social revolution. Soon, too many of us would be doing too much dope and getting paranoid or too much speed, coke and heroin. Once wasted on heroin, topping up with methadone seemed only natural. But for now, here I am, ecstatic about having landed the NME job, where I'm working alongside bright, witty and talented people on a paper that is widely admired and obsessively followed, particularly by young males. The Marianne Faithful interview, which was to make national newspaper headlines, came along while virtually all the titles owned by publishers, IPC, NME included, had been silenced because of a printer's strike. We carried on writing and banking articles, but there was a limit to this strategy, given that NME was about the new. We turned up at the office every day, though mostly to act silly. I remember playing human pyramids, whereby, starting with a wide base, we ascended as high as we could, layer by layer, kneeling on each other's backs. It wasn't a game that suited Nick Kent, and so we devised one that did. It was called Enter Mr. Kent. The first and only scene saw him entering the room with a flourish and everyone affecting to be impressed. The offer of two promising interviews came our way during this silliness. One was with Angie Bowie, scandalous and sexy, wife of David, and, as she was to tell it, a dynamic force in his rise to cult hero status and later to superstardom. Charlie bagged that one. I was happy to settle for Marianne Faithful, who for my generation of lustful males was an English Bridget Bardot, effortlessly desirable and with connections to what is usually called rock royalty. She'd been living on and off with Mick Jagger for some years, during which time she frequently came close to self-destruction. Throughout it all, the national tabloids kept a purient watch. They told it as a rocky horror show, starring Marianne as the lonely vamp, walking into plate glass windows, passing out on planes, losing Mick's child, tumbling down the stairs and prematurely delivering Nicholas Dunbar, weight four pounds. Suicide bids, drunk in the streets, a love affair with heroin and Valium and Mick, and an Italian film director called Mario Schifano, and always her mother, the unflappable Baroness Ariso, understanding it all and providing a sparse commentary so that Fleet Street didn't fall too far behind. Things like Marianne is much better now and Marianne will spend a week horse riding and relaxing before she and Mick return to England. Of course, I shouldn't be so lofty about tabloid journalism giving that prurient fascination was a big part of what motivated me to do the interview. On the other hand, she'd been quiet for years. It was a decade since her big seller, As Tears Go By, and she was now trying to burnish her credentials as a serious actress with a performance in John Osborne's A Patriot for Me. It told the story of Alfred Reddell, an Austrian officer who headed the pre-World War I counterintelligent efforts of Austria-Hungary, while simultaneously spying for Russia, and maybe for France and Italy too. Marianne, playing Redl's mistress, the Countess Sofia Delianov, spent much of the play in a flimsy nightgown, pleading with Redl not to leave her. After the curtain dropped for the night, she wrapped up tight in her fur coat, scarf and plaid slacks, 
and we moved into a galloping walk through Watford for the 1110 back to Euston. In the grubby knife-slashed compartment, she began warily. When I was younger, I was very idealistic. I thought it was possible to make the things you do really great. But when you get older, you realise you're lucky if it's just good. Before I got the chance to tread lightly, she was motioning towards life with Jagger and the phenomenal strain on their relationship. It really was difficult pursuing my own work when I was so involved with Mick because I loved him so much and to do movies you have to go away for three months and you inevitably get involved with other men and these things chip away at a relationship. The picture she painted of herself during the next several hours was of a woman whose determination to succeed as an actress of distinction is sunk by her addictive attachment to Jagger. Their relationship is absurdly volatile and destructive. And while Marianne talks melodramatically about their love for each other, you see Jagger as more distantly involved, shielding himself from the ultimate madness of it. I don't believe Marianne had opened up to a journalist quite this way before. Fleet Street certainly loved the raw, unguarded way she expressed herself and was happy to recycle many of the choicer quotes from a piece that ran to 6,300 words. Quotes such as, When I was about 16, I wanted to be an actress and a scholar too. But whatever I wanted to be, I wanted to be great at it. My first move was to get a rolling stone as a boyfriend. I slept with three and then I decided the lead singer was the best bet. Which three were they? I'm not going to tell you. Was the lead singer the most attractive or the most important? I knew he wasn't the most important because I had always understood that in the Stones, Keith was the most important. And I think in the beginning, I was always really in love with Keith, much more than anyone else, as a fan. She first became acquainted with the band via their manager, Andrew Lou Goldham, who she met at a showbiz party. Marianne, he decided, had a commercial face and her blonde sensuality perfectly complemented the degenerate ugliness of his band. She had three hits before getting to know Jagger intimately. As tears go by, come and stay with me and this little bird. None of the stones initially impressed her. They were the sort of people you idolise from a distance, but when you see them, they're really a disappointment. Well, they were to me. Horrible people. Dirty, smelly, spotty people. Then, of course, I fell in love with him. And from that minute, I really couldn't calculate. I couldn't work it. We just loved each other. We wanted to keep it and we couldn't in the end. He was so busy, so I really tried to cut myself back a bit and kept my work only in the royal court. And the effort of restraining myself and not working was terrible and I ended up on drugs. Jagger would come home after a recording session and find her sprawled across the bathroom floor again. The suicide bids became regular. I must have been a nightmare to live with. Poor Mick. Anyway, I'm okay now. I don't take handfuls of Mandy's every night and not a Valium passes my lips. The Beatles. Was she moved to applaud them as musicians and individuals? I knew Paul best and then George. I didn't really know John and Ringo. Were they a closed bunch? I'm sure John and Ringo were much more rigid than Mick and Keith were about the place of women. George still is. That's why Patty's gone. George is very jealous of his wife. He doesn't like her to have any friends. I mean, he's really fucked up her work too. It matters to Patty. The modelling jobs keep her together, you know. Yes, George is very, very jealous. Paul was really much more sophisticated because of falling in love with Jane Asher. Though she's a bit wet at the time, she was five times more worldly and city-bred than Cynthia or Maureen. I remember Cynthia telling me once that John wouldn't let her have a nanny. She was very furious because that was a sort of status symbol, I suppose. Talking about her generation, she said, We all wanted to have as much feeling as we could get hold of. We wanted to experience as much actual feeling, whether it was awful or nice or whatever. We wanted it because we knew and we were right that anything is better than no feeling. You have the martyrs of that school of thought who died and it's silly, but immeasurable numbers of people came through it. 
damaged, but through. We're all fucked up. We've got to accept that. I can't have an orgasm anymore. Little things fuck up. And that's coming from flooding myself with too much feeling. But I think it'll come back. There were no regrets? No, I loved it. I adored all that. Reveled in it. All the pain, and I'm very glad I had a resident artist in the house to record it all. The Marianne interview was the antithesis of what you could expect from a tidy PR orchestrated encounter. Here was someone who was in the mood to turn on her emotional hot tap and let it run. My April 1973 interview with Cherry Vanilla, David Bowie's press officer, was also full of unexpurgated dirty talk. But this time, I was on the receiving end of an old-fashioned commercial contrivance. The purpose was to sell Bowie, and knowing that sex sells, it was sex that was on Miss Vanilla's mind and lips. I told one FM radio station in LA that he makes love to just about everybody who works for him, at least once. But that's probably an exaggeration. He makes love to most of the people who work for him. But it was so funny because we were deluged with people who wanted jobs. Absolutely deluged. But he's a pretty wild character. He doesn't ever like to sleep alone. Yes, I've slept with him. David and I were already friends when we went to bed, so it wasn't a big romantic intrigue thing, which was groovy. But he's very heavy, physical. What of Bowie's wife, Angie? Angie goes to bed with who she wants to go to bed with. Angie's great. She's the perfect wife for David. They're both free to do whatever they want to do. They groove together. I guess you could say they're a modern couple. There was little in the way of good taste to be found in the faces changing rooms in the minutes before their April 1972 gig at the Little John Coliseum in Clemson, South Carolina. Whereas Marianne Faithful's tales of sex and longing were a melodrama you could believe in, and Sherry Vanilla's scripted sex talk was artless record-plugging. Watching Rod Stewart and the Faces in that crowded backstage changing room compulsively rear-mount each other, screech, feign ecstasy, and rapidly move on to the next, fully clothed, proffered bum, you knew it was their show-offy attempt to be smart asses and clever dicks. I had seen quite a lot of the group by then on their US Deep South tour, hopping from one gig to the next in pocket-sized planes. Close to performance time, you'd find them well lubricated by brandy and port and crackling with manic energy. They got on with each other as well as any group of musicians I'd seen. In fact, if I were in a sentimental mood, I'd probably call it love. We're talking Ian McLagan keyboards, Ronnie Lane bass, Kenny Jones drums and percussion, and Ronnie Wood guitar. They were rusty in Memphis, having been on stage together only once in the previous six weeks. So they stumbled and missed each other's cues. But they settled and began working through numbers we'd been hearing in Britain for some months. Maybe I'm amazed, gasoline alley, all over now, and long distance information. The crowd loved them. In 1972, the default position for high-status rock groups was aloof, but Stewart and co. preferred unhinged. They leapt, spun, and fell over each other. They switched mics at dazzling speed, whispered who knows what in each other's ears, and plotted and cackled. Rod was dressed for it, a yellow and black mock tiger suit, two yards of yellow scarf and blue sneakers. At the time, he was having his own career that ran alongside his work with The Faces. His newest album was 1971's Every Picture Tells a Story, which, as well as the title track, featured Mandolin Wind and Maggie May. You've done all right this year, I say to him after the show. Yeah, I did quite well. I know. I can keep turning out the music, but whether it's always going to be appreciated by the music press, I don't know. I suppose the more successful you get, you're in line for a knocking. I'm midway through a new album right now. It's great. It's not going to be brilliant. I'm just moderately proud of it. It's a nice follow-up to the other one, every picture. That new album was in the shops by July 1972. It was called Never a Dull Moment and featured what was to become 
two big selling singles, You Wear It Well and Sam Cooke's Twisting the Night Away. All four faces played on it, as they had done on every picture. But in the months and years to come, as Rod Starr waxed luminous, the faces faded. 1972 and gigs like the one in Clemson at the Little John Coliseum were probably the high watermark for Stewart and the band. The faces were sharper in Clemson than in Memphis, and their tightness allowed them to clown around even more. After the show, a hundred kids showed up at Clemson's Holiday Inn, hoping to catch a glimpse of Stewart and the band. Cans of beer and cakes were passed around by the swimming pool. The pilot who'd flown them in from Memphis was tossed in. Everyone was drunk. By 3am, most of the activity was confined to the bank of rooms occupied by the Faces entourage, where there were lots of comings and goings. Everyone hustled the beautiful university girls, but slowly they slipped away, unsullied. A lot of people think it's just a front, Rod had told me after the previous night's gig in the Mid-South Coliseum, Memphis. He was referring to the spirit of joyous camaraderie emanating from the five of them. They think we have to be different because other bands like arguing and splitting up. But it really is genuine. I swear it. In fact, I think the musical press must be surprised we haven't split up by now. I swear to God we're together for life. If Rod's powers of prophecy were imperfect, I am not the one to rub his nose in it. After being flown over with other British journalists to Los Angeles in October 1975 to see Bruce Springsteen's manically overhyped launch gig at the Roxy in Hollywood, my prediction was that within six months he would either be musically wiped out or more likely just another averagely regarded also ran more of my encounter with Bruce and his uniquely offensive manager in a while. I did better with the average white band, a six-piece Scottish soul funk outfit who didn't have a name and had played only one previous gig. When I first saw them perform at the 1972 Lincoln Festival, in a florid, worshipful piece for disc, it was their first music press coverage. I declared that... Already there's sufficient evidence to support the argument that this is the finest soul-inspired band Britain has ever produced. And AWB's subsequent life and times bore this out. Quick to spot their special qualities was co-founder of Atlantic Records, Jerry Wexler, the man who had signed and or revitalised the careers of Ray Charles, Aretha Franklin, Wilson Pickett, Dire Straits, Dusty Springfield and Bob Dylan. With Arif Mardin producing and arranging, Wexler supervised AWB's first US-made album, known simply as AWB. It topped the US charts, as did the single Pick Up the Pieces. Among the early admirers was Benny King, composer and singer of the imperishable Stand By Me, also James Brown's band leader, Fred Wesley. In later years, they were fashionably sampled by the likes of Ice Cube, De La Soul, Puff Daddy, Public Enemy, and even Janet Jackson and the Beastie Boys. My brother Mitch reminded me that spending time with talented star performers was what my dreams were once made of. And it's true, I was privileged and never forgot it. But that didn't mean I was to remain dreamingly uncritical Serving as a vapid mouthpiece for the musicians, I wrote about what would bore the hell out of readers, just as dive-bombing them with bombast wasn't the way to prove my independence. UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good. UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good. How nice it was to put away the blue pencil and just be a fan again. I was a fan when I met Paul Simon backstage after a London concert, for which he was supported by a very classy backing band. I remember very little of the particulars, other than it was a smallish theatre with excellent acoustics. It was sometime after May 1973 and the release of his solo masterpiece, 
There Goes Rhyming Simon. It's worth listing the tracks, each one a Simon composition and each carrying an inspired arrangement. Kodachrome Tenderness, Take Me to the Mardi Gras, Something So Right, One Man's Ceiling is Another Man's Floor, American Tune, Was a Sunny Day, Learn How to Fall, St. Jude's Comet, Loves Me Like a Rock. Venturing backstage at the end of the performance, I recall a quiet, respectful hubbub and the chinking of wine glasses. He was 15 feet away. I waited for a break in his conversation before walking purposefully towards him. Suddenly, I heard myself saying how much I admired his work and that usually I'm a cool character. Definitely not a gusher, but his tunes and lyrics were so extraordinarily classy, moving and witty, etc. And even as I'm saying these treacly words, I feel like an enormous phony who does this to all the star names. Simon said very little. His head was tilted downwards. Was he embarrassed, flattered, worn out? Not normally being a gusher and therefore bad at it, I didn't know how to stop. I probably went on to thank him in portentous tones with sweaty hands on behalf of humanity. Look how many years I've remembered as crushingly significant what is actually a nothing kind of incident although I could just as easily formulate that sentence the other way around. Mitch would have loved to have met poor Simon, though he tells me nothing could have topped the experience he had one starry night in January 1973 when we sat together in the stalls at the Rainbow Theatre, North London, for Eric Clapton's comeback gig. Clapton was widely considered the most fluent and soulful blues-influenced guitarist of the 60s, until Jimi Hendrix arrived on the London scene with his eye-popping brilliance. Clapton had been lost to heroin since the turn of the 1970s, but spurred on by Pete Townsend of The Who, the Rainbow Gig was his declaration that he was back in business. His pick-up musicians for the night were two former Blind Faith bandmates, Stevie Winwood and Rick Gretsch, as well as Traffic's Jim Capaldi and Ron Wood who would soon switch from the faces to the stones. Townsend also played. A supporting act that night was a still essentially unknown average white band. A couple of rows in front of Mitch and me at the Rainbow were Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr. Immediately behind was Elton John. And when we both went to empty our bladders during the break, there was McCartney again, with the Tyler brothers now alongside him making small talk. McCartney agreed with Mitch that it was a fantastic concert. I introduced myself as an NME man, and whether out of concern for my health or as revenge for a bad write-up, he said, I look terrible and should take a break. He probably had a point. Writing for NME was toil as well as fun and satisfaction. You'd review a gig and maybe do an 800-word write-up the same night. Features, calling for a backstory, and hours of days on the road with your subject were between 2,500 and 5,000 words. They too would need a rapid turnaround, which for me usually meant chain-smoking through an all-night writing session, during which I'd also transcribe the subject's tape-recorded words via my feeble manual typewriter. But there were also moments of sublime contentment, such as when I found myself sitting at a little white table by the swimming pool of a Memphis motel, banging out a story on my romantic manual typewriter. It was both romantic and feeble, about Stax Records. Stax was a label and recording studio greatly esteemed within musical circles for its rich, soulful sound. It had been the home of Otis Redding and its house band was Booker T and the MGs. If Motown was the soulful sound of the combustible motor city, Stax was Memphis, and Memphis was midwife to rock and roll and had a leading role in shaping the blues itself. That moment in Memphis by the pool was bliss, but the real fun for me was had in the company of my NME colleagues. Some of it centred on the rented house in Maida Vale, West London, that I had a room in since 1971. As my original flatmates left, they were replaced by NME scribblers. Ian MacDonald was a flat sharer for some time, Ian, probably the brainiest of us all, was NME's deputy editor and, in that role, was pivotal 
in developing the paper's stylish appearance and, together with the features editor, Tony Tyler, its witty iconoclasm. He went on to write Revolution in the Head, one of the best-regarded books on the Beatles, and also a book deciphering the political tribulations that faced classical composer Dmitry Shostakovich under Stalin's Soviet Union. Ian was at his most innocent and graceful when being utterly silly, but he would slump to the darkness of places from which I found it impossible to draw him back. Nick Kemp was another flatmate. He was surprisingly quiet and old-fashioned polite. When Smack was messing up his digestion, he lived on pots of yogurt and powdered mashed potato. There was one night, after he had fallen into a comatose state, that I thought we were going to lose him. Ian and I got him to Paddington Hospital by cab. He was quickly onto a stretcher and being hurried down a long corridor when, bizarrely, he sat up from his prone position, Lazarus-like, called for the stretcher bearers to halt, climbed off and headed back to where we'd come in. The emergency had been real, but this was Nick, nervous of police involvement, mustering his considerable powers of survival to take himself to safety. But there was more to Nick than his habit. His girlfriend, Chrissy Hind, would periodically visit and I'd see her practicing guitar in his bedroom, producing innovative chord changes, then thrashing at the strings like someone in training to take on the title holder. I suspect in Chrissy's mind, the incumbent was Patti Smith, judging by the way I once heard her speak of Smith, with a combination of contempt and admiration. Chrissy was a natural. As well as her music, she was writing strong pieces for NME and was an impressive caricaturist. Another of Kent's girlfriends, with flair and elan, was a French tightrope walker whose name was Hermani. It's as though an art house impresario was at work, putting together his love matches. Later, a then virtual unknown Paulie Yates came calling. But I think that was more to behold the legend that Kent now was in certain niche circles than anything romantic. That was My Life as an Animal by Andrew Tyler and read by Jim Smith. Produced by Tom Davidson and adapted for UK Health Radio by Monkey Nut Audiobooks. My Life as an Animal is available on Audible and audiobook sites. Be sure to tune in next time to hear more from this title. This audiobook is published by Monkey Nut Audiobooks in Hampshire, UK.